Well, top of the morning to you, everyone. Um, welcome to another episode of the Sons of History. Alan, how is it going over there? Uh, it's going lovely. We're enjoying a nice uh, Saturday morning, so... Yeah. Yeah, this is a rarity for us. Uh, we usually do afternoon. I was a little concerned because I choose the mid-afternoon because... I know that there aren't going to be anybody mowing their lawns at that time. So us getting started at 10 a.m., that was high risk. Uh, so far, so good. We will see how things turn out moving forward. Uh, so I don't hear anybody mowing lawns and using blowers and weed eaters. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Sons of History, if you haven't yet... Be sure to subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, or if you're just listening on the podcast, subscribe, please do. Also, share it with your friends. Let them know, hey, this is where you want to go to listen about uh, historical subjects. Leave us a rating and review if you're listening on Apple Podcasts. Also, you can visit our website, thesonsofhistory.com. Check out some of our gear. Uh, Epic TV, we do a lot of stuff over there. I've got a JFK Jr. documentary. Um, pretty, pretty, pretty. Pretty good. Um, I got my also, documentary too. Don't forget. Don't forget no, I'm still no, working on mine. No, you don't. You don't have Gulf, it. It's not Gulf even Coast, up. Gulf Coast campaign. I got Mike Bunn of the 14th Colony. I got Wesley Odom, the Siege of Pensacola. I interviewed them. Interviewed uh, Kenneth Ramagos to Here, discover here's the, thing, the true Alan, location. Here's of the, the thing, Alan. What? If you bring up this supposed documentary one more time, this documentary that you have yet to put up, I will drive downtown to Houston, way out of my way, just to come over, slap you and break your glasses, okay? You know, maybe if you would help me a little bit on this documentary, since you are the documentary no. and doc, doc, no. documentarian. No. <laughs> You're the guy who knows how to do documentaries. You know, it is Saturday. You were supposed to contact me last night so we could do a screen share so I could help you. And guess who didn't I, I, contact me? You. Uh, I, I was and, a bit uh, nope, and today uh, indisposed is with a f few domestic uh, issues I had I to deal with. I don't want to hear so. it. I don't want to hear it at all. So, ladies and gentlemen, that documentary of the Gulf Coast campaign remains to be seen. I highly doubt it's going to come out anytime soon, especially according to the schedule of which I think you gave Wesley Odom. You said, hey, it's going to come out this time. I don't think you're going to hit the deadline. And I'm only saying that because I want to put a fire under your butt so you'll end up doing it. I never said when it was going to come out. I said I was going to get it out as fast as possible. The only I think you gave Wesley to... Odom a deadline. No, I did not give him a deadline. I think you did. I No. No, I did not. No, I am going to go visit him again in December, but that's that's a different story. But uh, no, I, I did not because I knew that I was the one who's going to be doing most of the work, and and you're you know you're the one who does all the documentaries, and well, this one I'm on my own on this. It one, is so. time you learn how to do it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Before we waste too much time, I do have a lot of questions for our upcoming guest, uh, Peter Zion. He has written a fantastic book, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization. Fascinating book, a lot of questions. Um, so we're going to be talking about the end of the world, literally. Uh, we'll be discussing about the near future and the present day, but this book is also chock full of a lot of really geopolitical history. Um Really good stuff. But before we get into uh, having Peter on the show, let's do our This Week in History. Do you mind, good sir? I actually think this would be the perfect opportunity because got something in store for uh, my presentation today. I cannot wait. All right, let's do it. All right, so much like uh, they give out honorary degrees, I give you the honorary This Week in History. So go ahead. Okay, wait. Are you kidding me right now? It is 10 a.m. You got to be kidding me. I'm You're enjoying right? a little bit of scotch. Hey, it's not 10 a.m. in Scotland, so, but, wow, Ah, okay. Now, the reason why I'm drinking this early in the morning, 
which I normally wouldn't, but uh, have to enjoy a little bit of scotch because now this isn't going to be my This Week in History, but it just so happens that it coincides. October 28th of 1919, you had the Volstead Act, which was also when Prohibition began. Yay! So up yours, what is that, the 18th Amendment? Whatever that was, (laughs) National Prohibition Act. Yeah, what a terrible choice that was. Wow. Ah, Yeah, I could joke around that so was the 19th Amendment, but I don't want to piss off half the country. (laughs) Anyway, okay, so... (laughs) The reason why this one is going to be my, a, a special this week in history is because we are going to talk about the um, the Battle of White Plains. Now, the reason why it's going to be special is because I I, comp- I put in a lot of maps uh, to help uh, everyone kind of understand a little bit. They g- get a better idea of uh, of uh, what happened and where and what and why and all that stuff. But you know, when we were declaring our independence down in Philadelphia. Uh, the British uh, were busy trying to take over the uh, country again. Uh, they invaded in uh, New- they invaded Staten Island, and uh, on uh, August twenty seventh, they uh, they invaded uh, Brooklyn. And there, you know there was a series of big battles that uh, eventually led to us being kicked out of Brooklyn through Brooklyn Heights. We made an escape into Manhattan, and then about. You know, a couple weeks later, uh, they landed. The British landed in Kipps Bay and took over uh, took over pretty much most of Manhattan, with the exception of uh, the Harlem area. There was a battle uh, in the uh, in Harlem Heights. We stopped them, but the problem was is that uh, Washington knew that the British, who ha- controlled the water, could just swing around and capture Washington's entire military force, trapping them in the Harlem and the Yonkers area. So. Um, he went. Uh, he moved his army, abandoned Manhattan, pretty much with the exception of uh, Fort Washington, uh, which was across from Fort Lee. If you look at the George Washington Bridge uh, um, um, that connects Manhattan with New Jersey, uh, right there is where uh, Fort Washington was, and we left a few thousand troops there. Uh, unfortunately, they got left behind for a reason, but... Uh, but Washington's men, they moved north. They were up in, into the Yonkers area. And eventually they, they kept moving north until they reached the, the town of White Plains. Now, the reason why they took, they, they stationed themselves in White Plains is that there were a lot of natural barriers there. Um, there were swamps. There was the Bronx River. Uh, there were a lot of hills. So it, it was a good defensible position. Uh, the British, uh, they, they, Tried some amphibious landings. Um, there was uh, there was an issue in, at Throg's Neck. They tried to land there, but there was too much resistance. So they landed at Pell's Point, and then they moved north, where they stopped uh, north of New Rochelle and prepared to battle at White Plains. Now, the um, George Washington he had the Continental Army, he he had the militia, and he had some Native American soldiers. Uh, Native American allies on his side, whereas William Howe, who led the British, uh, he had his redcoats, he had American loyalists, uh, he had the Iroquois Indians, and he had, uh, you know, people like to say Hessian mercenaries, but they were more of German auxiliaries because they were not really mercenaries and they weren't just Hessians. So he had the German auxiliaries and they met, they met at White Plains. So they, so, um, what what the U.S. did, what uh, Washington did, was uh, there is a hill just to the west of White Plains. Uh, it's called uh, Chatter- Chatterton's Hill. So it's kind of an elevated position um, just to the west of town. The British felt that this was the ideal place uh, to capture that first rather than go into the town. So there were a couple of attacks on, on Chatterton's Hill. Um, there were two, two of them frontal attacks didn't quite work out so well, but, uh, this, uh, German named Rawl, now Rawl's name will appear again because he was at the battle of Trenton. He was in fact, uh, he was there on Christmas day and he was killed in battle when, uh, when Washington crossed the Delaware and attacked Trenton. But for right now, he kind of did a, um, a, uh, he swung around the American lines and attacked the Americans from their right, uh, their, their right flank, and the American line collapsed. Shatterton's Hill was then captured by the British. So now 
Washington on his right flank, he had the British occupying a hill. Howe wanted to attack Washington and finally annihilate Washington and end the entire rebellion. Uh, but it rained for a couple of days. And when the rain stopped and Howe was about to attack, which was on November the 1st, um, Washington had abandoned his position and moved north to fight another day. And uh, they eventually uh, crossed uh, the Hudson River, also known as the North River, at Peekskill. And they marched south and ended up crossing through New Jersey and ended up crossing the Delaware into Pennsylvania. And this was when uh, Thomas Paine wrote his uh, famous work, The Crisis, um, Fort Lee was abandoned. The, the guys at Fort Washington, they were, they were left behind. Uh, they eventually, there was a battle there. They got captured. But for the most part, White Plains was the last major battle before, uh, well, at least as far as Washington was concerned, not counting Fort Washington. It was the last major battle before his desperate gamble at uh, Trenton on the day after Christmas. So... That was uh, White Plains, Battle of White Plains. It's not really that well known, but it was a big major battle of the Revolutionary War. I th yeah, that's uh, it's an interesting battle. I think we have officially thrown out the whole idea of like two minutes. That is how many minutes? How many? How, how many minutes did that past. one go? You know what? I don't even want to talk about it, ladies and gentlemen. I know that there is a fly in here and it's driving me nuts. So if you do see the fly while uh, I'm talking, um, I'm not living in filth. I do know the fly is in here. Um, now, Alan, I want to correct something that you said on your this week in history. I don't believe. The, the town is called New Rochelle. I believe it's called New Rochelle Rochelle. Uh, is this the thing about from Minsk to Milan? You're, you're thinking about the one in Minsk to Milan. I don't yeah, know it's, uh, it, that's about a young girl's exotic journey from Milan to Minsk. Whatever. <laughs> it's well, you know, it's not safe to go to Minsk now because, you know, you've got the uh, Ukraine war just next door. Anyways, I'm going to get right back into my This Week in History. So mine, we're talking about globalization, um, the global community uh, unraveling, coming apart. Interestingly that enough that we would talk about it this week, this week in history, October 24th, 1945, the United Nations is officially founded. Peace dignity and equality on a healthy planet. I wonder how many times they've changed up that uh, slogan of theirs, but that's what's on there uh, right now. Nothing but greatness comes out of San Francisco, right? Ain't that the truth? Uh, so San Francisco is where the United Nations was founded. And here is what their website says. I'm just going to pull some stuff from the website. As World War II was about to end in 1945, nations were in ruins and the world wanted peace. Representatives of 50 countries gathered at the United Nations Conference on International Organization in good old San Francisco, California from April 25th to June 26th, 1945. For the next two months, they proceeded to draft and then sign the UN Charter, which created a new international organization, the United Nations, which it was hoped would prevent another world war like the one they have just lived through. Now, yes, that has taken place. We haven't had another world war since then. Now, as they on the website, now, more than 75 years later, the United Nations is still working to maintain international peace and security, give humanitarian assistance to those in need, protect human rights, and uphold international law. All noble things. All these things are noble in which they pursue. And then all of a sudden, on the homepage, you got this. At the same time, the United Nations is doing new work, not envisioned for it, in 1945 by its founders. Hmm, interesting. The United Nations has set sustainable development goals for 2030 in order to achieve a better and more sustainable future for us all. UN member states have also agreed to climate action to limit, this is wild, to limit global warming. I'm surprised that they're still, they're calling it global warming instead of climate change. Isn't that the new thing? It's climate yeah, change? That, that changed a while back. Yeah, they, 
This is on their website right now. UN, whoever's running your website, you got to update it. It's no longer like global warming's in the past. That's an old thing, right? It's like global cooling that was decades prior to the global warming scare. It's climate change now because now that's all encompassing. I tell you, man, it never ends. It never ends. This is what happens when powerful people get bored. They just say, you know what? What else can we do? We got to do something or we're, otherwise we're not relevant anymore. Well, I mean, it's been it's been never ending. I remember the '70s; it was it was global cooling, and then the '80s; it was uh, well, not just nuclear, unilateral nuclear disarmament was the big thing, and then there was uh, what was going on with the um, rainforests in Brazil, ozone layer, and then they switched gears. And I mean, it, there, there, it's it's been crisis after crisis after crisis since. Yeah, then. and a lot of these crises manufactured. Like you should look into how many fires that took place in California just over the number of years. Like how many of them are actually arson fires, and a lot of them that took place in Australia. A lot of those were arson fires too. It's just like now I'm not saying all of them, but a lot. It's alarming. And so whenever there's a fire, like, oh, climate change. So anyways, yeah, good old UN. Uh, we'll be discussing them in the conversation with Peter. So that is my This Week in History. You're welcome. All right, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we've got an awesome guest with us on the show. His name is Peter Zion. Z-E-I-H-A-N. He's a geopolitical strategist and the founder of the consulting firm Zion on Geopolitics. His clients include corporations, financial institutions, universities, and the U.S. military. He's the author of several works, including The Accidental Superpower, The Absent Superpower, Disunited Nations, and the latest book, and the one we'll be discussing, The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization He's an incredibly smart guy. He's also funny, and he is also very historically sound. So, hello, just like Alan and myself, uh, can you ask for a better person to talk to? I say no. What do you say, Alan? I say let's get this thing going because I am eager to hear what he has to say. (laughs) All right. Well... Ladies and gentlemen, we've got Peter on the line. Literally, it's going to be an audio-only discussion. We've got Peter on the line. Peter, how are you doing, man? It's been a, it's been a crazy year, but I'm good. Well, according to your book, um, it's probably going to get a whole lot crazier. Oh, yeah, um, so much crazier. <laughs> yeah, and I am honestly, like, I loved reading your book, and thank you for adding some humor into it. That made it uh, a little bit more digestible, but things are not looking good for the world. But I will say this, Alan and I are down in Houston. Thank you for looking so favor- favorably <laughs> on us. We we'll greatly appreciate that. Um, so your book is called The End of the World is Just the Beginning, Mapping the Collapse of Globalization. And I want to get right on to this. This is not globalism in the form of like the World Economic Forum and their craziness. This is globalization as far as like trade and different things. And I want you to explain a lot of that, but I want to use a quote from early in your book that you wrote, since 1945, the world has been the best it has ever been, the best it will ever be. This world, our world is doomed. The 2020s will see a collapse of consumption and production and investment and trade almost everywhere. Globalization will shatter into pieces. So why has it been the best ever and why is our world doomed? So if I was going to put my finger on one specific precipitating event, it would have been D-Day. While we had been involved in World War I, with D-Day and the push to Berlin, it really was just American forces carrying the load. And once we got a taste of just how destructive industrial warfare in Europe could be, we realized that if we were ever going to contain the Soviet Union, uh, the commitment in troops and lives were going to be something that the American population would have never supported. So we needed allies and we needed allies that were willing, knowingly, to be cannon fodder in a conflict between the Americans and the Soviets. So we set up an economic system that would induce people to join our side. 
You've heard of Bretton Woods, you've heard of the IMF and the World Bank, but these are all pieces of globalization. The idea that the United States would use its military power on the high oceans to enable anyone to go anywhere at any time and interface with any partner and access any raw material at any market. In essence, it was like everyone who joined our side would have had all the economic benefits of having won the war all by themselves. And it triggered the greatest period of industrialization and economic growth and personal income growth in human history. And it lasted for 75 years. And that's how we all got electricity. That's how we all got plumbing. That's how we all got the internet and products from China and raw materials from Africa and energy from the Middle East. Uh, this is our world in a nutshell. But there's, there's two problems. Number one, the Cold War is over. And even with the Russian resurgence in Ukraine, there has not been a hint of talk out of the Biden administration about reinvigorating globalization. It's a bilateral security series of agreements, and that's it. We actually have not stopped prosecuting our trade wars against even the Europeans, uh, with the exception of uh, one deal with Airbus. Everything else is still going. Biden is still putting body into Trump's tweets when it comes to trade disputes. And then second, when we industrialized, we all started living differently. It used to be that if you had food and coal and iron ore and oil, you could have a modern economy. But that changed with globalization because before 90% of the world's population didn't have those things. With globalization, you only needed one and you could trade for all the others. And so the whole world started moving up. That's one of the reasons why the alliance was so potent. Everyone was part of it. But when you industrialize, you start taking manufacturing and services jobs and you specialize and you move off the farm and into town. And on the farm, kids are free labor. You have loads. But when you're in town, kids are really expensive, really annoying, really aggravating pieces of mobile furniture. And adults aren't dumb. We had fewer of them. You play that forward 75 years and the advanced world hasn't run out of children. That happened 30 years ago. We're now running out of adults. And so it's been a bit of a starvation diet as the population has aged. When everyone was in their 20s and their 30s, we got this massive consumption boom. Think of what happened in the 70s with the baby boomers or in the 2000s with the Chinese. When everyone's in their 40s and 50s, you get this big productivity boom. Think about the United States in the 1990s or the Koreans for the last 30 years. But then you all hit retirement and it's over. And for most of the world's demographic structures, we do not even have an economic model that suggests they can function in a world unless someone pays them to exist. That doesn't happen very often. And so everything about globalization is in its final decade. And I would argue conflicts like the Ukraine war are the harbingers of what's to come. Uh, <clears throat> they're in a series of military conflicts that are going to break out because of changes of consumption, production, investment. Uh, and then another series that are going to break out, out because the United States is stepping back from the world. Uh, the Ukraine war is just the first. So stepping back from the world, um, how much does the U.S. Navy hold this whole globalization together? Right now, we have at any given time over 10,000 ships on the waves that are traveling completely without any sort of escort. Uh, about half of those travel within their own region, but half of those in, by half of those by volume are transoceanic. That is the entirety of global energy trade and global manufacturers trade. And it's the input stream for 80% of global agriculture. So if that cracks, you're looking at a catastrophic failure. Uh, we've only had to deal with, you know, Somalis and speedboats from a piracy point of view to this point. Uh, but we're very close to the position where the United States and the Europeans are going to start grab Russian shipping. And so once the real countries start doing that, all bets are off. Yeah, this is how we went to war with the Barbary pirates. When we oh, lost wow, the, that's, a way, that's a way back Wednesday. Yes, exactly. Yeah, when uh, when we lost the protection of the British Royal Navy, they uh, they started attacking our shipping. Um, so, okay, so 
would with the fact that uh, people are having less children the thing that comes to mind is 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 this the reason why they're allowing uh, so much uh, illegal immigration into this country other than maybe for political reasons to get votes <laughs> but um do they look at this as well you know if the americans aren't going to uh, have children then we're going to have to get people from other parts of the world to come in here and give us those children well, I'm going to say a lot of things that are probably unpopular in Texas here in the next couple of minutes. Uh, <laughs> Go for uh, it. Number one, the United States is not particularly well thought in a lot of its policies, domestic or international. That's not new. This falls into that category. Uh, number two, the greatest supporter of illegal migration in American history was the Trump administration. Because the Sonoran and the Chihuahuan deserts are the best natural borders in North America. And by building a wall down the middle of it, we had to build 50 roads to go through the desert to reach the construction sites. And so we took half of the best barrier we've ever had to illegal migration and obviated it. And we would have nowhere near the number of illegals crossing in if it wasn't for that program. Because all you have to do to get to the United States now is cross half the desert and use a ladder once. And Trump took care of the rest. That's hilarious. Mm. Yeah, that. What is that? Uh, good intentions. You know, path to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> I mean, it's so, for what it's worth, though. This isn't something that's going to last too much longer. Um, Mexico started industrializing with the adoption of NAFTA in 1995, and their birth rate dropped by half. So net migration from Mexico to the United States has been negative for 12 of the last 13 years. So it'll probably never be positive again. Central America started industrializing in 2000, and their birth rate dropped by half. So this is probably the last surge. Within five years, this is probably not going to be a significant problem. So population plays a pretty big role, at least in a large section early in your book. Um, and you do point out China a lot in your book on how terribly they're going to fare in the coming years. So bad. Why exactly are they going to do so terribly? Well, you've all heard of the one-child policy that was adopted roughly 40 years ago. And the communist-turned-fascist bureaucracy basically penalized people with fines and up to jail time if they had more than one kid. Uh, it got to the point that there were a lot of forced abortions. You do that for 40 years. Uh, and you've guaranteed that your population under age 30 will be half of what it was before. But that wasn't the only thing going on. At the same time that the one-child policy was at its height, the Chinese were rapidly industrializing, and they were moving off the farm and into the cities and having fewer kids anyway. So it has been the fastest population collapse in human history, faster than the Black Death in Europe. And it's left us with a population now that cannot regenerate. So a few years ago, the Chinese finally realized that they may have overcompensated a little bit and changed it to a two-child policy. Now it's a three-child policy, and I think it's in the process of being formally abandoned. And the bureaucrats that were once responsible for the forced abortions are now responsible for encouraging kids to have or having encouraging people to have more kids. But China's already urbanized. Everyone's already living in efficiency apartments. There's no room for the kids in their lives, physically or mentally. And so the birth rate is actually continuing to drop. And in places like Beijing and Shanghai, on average, a woman only has 0.75 kids over their lifetimes now. So it's not that we're below replacement. We were below replacement 30 years ago. We are now in full-on population collapse. And the Chinese are grudgingly admitting publicly that they have already that they have overcounted their population by 100 million in that time, suggesting that we are looking at full demographic and economic collapse this decade, assuming nothing else goes wrong. And in just the last week, the Biden administration basically killed their entire tech sector. So plenty of other things are going wrong. And will this affect Taiwan? Uh, I'm, I'm of a minority. I don't think that Taiwan is any meaningful danger. Uh, their economy is partially integrated with the mainland. I think that's the biggest point of exposure. I think that was unwise on their part, but you know, people do what people do. 
uh, the, the Xi government in China has become ossified. It, it's a cult of personality that is tighter than any we've ever seen before, including the Kim dynasty in North Korea. And there is no one who wants to bring Xi any information, not information that they think will make him mad, any information at all. And mm -hmm. so he's making a series of bad and increasingly disconnected from reality decisions. Uh, but it's the Ukraine war that I think has really changed the calculus. The, the Chinese use the Russians as kind of a canary when they're thinking of doing something. They let the Russians do it first, see outside how it comes out. Uh, so like the liberalization in the 1980s is a great example. They, they saw perestroika and glasnost in action. It led to the fall of the Soviet Union. They're like, whoa, whoa, we're not doing that. Uh, and it's happening with the Ukraine war. So number one, they thought the war would be easy. Uh, but you can walk to Kiev. You have to swim to Taipei. And Kiev has only been preparing for this war for eight years. Taiwan has been preparing for 45. So like, okay, okay, okay. This is going to be a harder war than we thought. Assumption number two, we assume that Russian weapons are really good. And so they cloned Russian weapons for most of their military buildout. And now they have massive buyers or theft remorse, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so, you know, exception two is gone. A <laughs> little, Freudian, three, little Freudian slip there, huh? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, assumption three was that no one will sanction Russia because it's too important to the international economy. Well, whoops. And, and say what you will about the Russian economy. It's a massive exporter of energy and food products, whereas China is the largest importer of both. If you cut off China from international food supplies and the things that go into fertilizer and fuel, they will de-industrialize in under a year and a half and probably have 500 million people suffering from famine. That's the end of China as a modern industrialized power. But I think the thing that scared them the most were the boycotts. Most of the restrictions on operations in Russia were not done by governments. It was individual companies saying, we don't want to be a part of this. And that is the entire Chinese development model. So every assumption that they have made for the last 40 years to prepare for Taiwan has been proven laughably wrong. They've got to start over. And it's not clear in a one-man cult of personality government that that's even theoretically possible. So, yeah, I think, I think Taiwan's going to be okay. Well, okay, so – you know, I'm listening to all this, um, I, I am thinking again of the whole eugenics um, policies that took place. A and, and, topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that the reason for it obviously was because the the smart, good people were not having children and the ignorant poor were. So how is that going to be a factor? Because I know that in many of the the, the um, uh, religious fanatical places in the Middle East and the and in uh, you know some areas of Central America. Well, you you mentioned Central America that their birth rate has gone down. I don't think in the Middle East that the birth rate has gone down. Uh, you can correct me on that one. But how is that going to be a factor in terms of the you know the lowering birth rates in the industrialized world? Well. Let's start with eugenics. There was a lot of things we didn't understand about population policy when that existed. And so leaving aside the uh, the racism and the I get to play God in your life angles of that, which I would frown upon. Mm -hmm. uh, we were we were sterilizing people who had non. Genetic conditions, thinking that made a difference, things like bad eyesight in Sweden, for example. Uh, and so I would argue that our science had not yet cut up to what some bureaucrat thought was a brilliant idea. And the damage that we did to ourselves across the world uh, was not minor. Uh, as to the competition, if that's the word you want to use, between the advanced world and parts of the other, the rest of the world that we're, you know, maybe less than enthused of at the moment, uh, I am not too concerned about that. Well, let me rephrase that. I am concerned in a very different way. Um, you are correct in that for the most part, birth rates in the Middle East have not dropped, but it's not because these areas have industrialized or built up their agricultural system. It's because they've been living on resource rents and they're able to import what they need from the advanced world uh, in order to feed themselves and have basic technology, well, basic technology, that sounded wrong, uh, in order to enjoy an industrial lifestyle without actually industrializing, mm -hmm. which means if you break down globalization and transport, most of them are fucked. 
because they don't have the capacity to supply themselves and they are utterly dependent upon civilian levels of security on the high seas in order to generate the income that they need to buy what they want. And if that breaks down, they don't just have a birth rate correction, they have a population correction because these guys import on average more than half of their foodstuffs. So yeah, but I mean, but is, sending their people to Europe and... Um, I have and, no doubt that in a world of economic stress that the Europeans will act like Europeans. There are very limited routes that you can get in. And if the Europeans decide that, that their culture is under serious threat, they will dust off some older policies and uh, do what they do best. And it'll be ugly. And we will have significant famine across most of the Middle East. Uh, I'm not so worried about Algeria and Morocco. They have more advanced systems. This is not where the migrants are coming from. Uh, and they have decent trade relations. Uh, Libya is probably going to be occupied by the end of this. Egypt will be terrifying. Egypt, if it switched all of its farmland to wheat, it still can't feed its population. So you're looking at losing at least a third of the population, assuming climate change doesn't cause a problem, assuming they can still import the, the uh, fertilizers that they need. Saudi Arabia is probably going to enter into a de facto military pact with an outside power who will probably provide them with food in exchange for oil. And you might see echoes of that in places like Kuwait or the UAE. But overall, I think we're going to see a lot less resource exports from the overall region. And that means we're going to have population adjustments. Um, for, for the last decade or two, this transmigration issue has been an interesting test case because we've seen how the Europeans have responded to it in a period of physical security and economic growth. You remove those two pillars and the Europeans are going to act differently. And honestly, so are the Turks on the way and so are the Moroccans. So will we have a refugee move? Yeah, and it'll be stopped cold. And then we're gonna have some significant population adjustments uh, in a number of places. I was actually be more concerned about the Russians in Central Asia because there are fewer barriers. There are no good choke points. The level of desperation will be higher and the Russian state on the backside of the, this war is likely to be much weaker. I think you're going to see what you're concerned about. I think you're just concerned about the wrong part of the world. So you, um, speaking of like the world um, bringing it into America, you, you state in the book that America will largely escape the carnage to come. So you also write that America is going to update the Monroe Doctrine. So how, how is that going to help America escape what's coming? Sure. So th there's, there's really no foreign power that thinks it's a good idea to mess around in Mexico anymore, you know, independent of the fact that the Mexicans have an order of magnitude more internal capacity now than a century ago. Uh, Mexico is absolutely its own thing. And since it is it and the United States are each other's top trading partner in most categories, uh, people realize that if you mess with Mexico, you mess with the United States. Uh, we are in the process of kind of extending that mindset over the rest of Central America and the Caribbean sands of Cuba. And in a world where the Chinese and the Russians are obsessed with local issues, I really do think Cuba is going to come in from the cold and we'll have a broadly productive relationship. And they kind of join the NAFTA family, if you will. Uh, the, the opportunities there for manufacturing are actually quite impressive. Um, that just leaves South America. And people forget that South America is not one thing. You've got your northern tier of Colombia and Venezuela, which are separated from one another, but have Caribbean frontage. We already have a free trade deal with Colombia, and we're in the early stages of seeing their integration into NAFTA structures. Ecuador, Peru, and Chile are separated from everyone else by the Himalayas. We already have a free trade deal with the Chileans, uh, and relations with the Peruvians are reasonable. Ecuador is kind of its own thing. Uh, the only place where you can get integration within the region is the southern cone of Brazil, Argentina, and the Guays. Um, but Brazil is dependent upon international trade. Argentina is not. So we can have that part of the world, which is further from us than Europe, kind of go its own way 
Uh, and as long as we keep foreign powers from using the Western Hemisphere as a foothold, it's, this, is a, this is an easy carry. Uh, one of the reasons that the Monroe Doctrine worked, even though we didn't have a functional Navy at the time, it, the Western Hemisphere is a long haul from the Eastern Hemisphere's land masses, especially when you're talking about places like Japan or Europe that are far north instead of far south. So we can build out a system where we incrementally expand the economic orbit of NAFTA to countries that are willing uh, and eager, I might add, um, while at the same time, we basically put up a bit of an invisible barrier around the hemisphere to prevent others from coming in and engaging in anything cute. Uh, it used to be that the Russians slash Soviets were very active in places like Ecuador or Mexico or Venezuela or Granada or Cuba. But we've seen a complete collapse of the Russian position globally because of the Ukraine war. They need everything that they have in that war. And they've closed down the Wagner operations in Africa. They've pulled almost all of their equipment out of Armenia and Syria. They've removed their bases from the Chinese border. They've even closed down their bases on the border with Finland, which is about to join NATO. Everything they have is going to Ukraine. And win or lose, they will not be able to rebuild their positions in most places, which makes Monroe that much easier. Hmm. Well, do you think China is going to stab Russia in the back? Uh, depends. If the, uh, if the Russian nuclear arsenal proves to be as in bad of shape as everything else in the Russian military, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, uh, eastern Siberia is in play. Uh, but they're going to wait for the Russians to launch and fail to launch before they would make that decision. Now, I personally don't think the Russians are going to hit the big red button. I think the case for that is past. It used to be that they were seriously considering nuking Berlin, Warsaw, Stockholm, Paris, and London in order to disrupt the weapons flows into Ukraine. But at the Battle of Izium last month, the Ukrainians captured, in 36 hours, more equipment from the Russians than NATO had transferred in seven months. So the Ukrainians now, their biggest problem is like deferred maintenance on Russian equipment. Um, and if they decided they wanted to go for, say, the United States, we made it very clear to Putin that if you do hit the U.S., uh, the first person will die, who dies is everyone who's in the blast radius of the weapon that is targeting Putin personally. And so he doesn't get to write the history here. Uh, history will record him as the person who destroyed the Russian Federation. And since then, he personally has not threatened nukes. He's left it to his flunkies. Um, now, one other thing I want to ask is, is that uh, with the collapse of uh, world populations, I, I, does this play in the hands of the globalists? Because my understanding is they want a population of, say, 3 billion. Yeah, you know, I, let me poke a hole in that conspiracy theory real quick. The World Economic Forum is basically an excuse for rich people to do body shots. There's not a lot of planning there. Uh, it's really not very impressive from either an intellectual point of view or any sort of planning. It's just a party. Um, as for what the sustainable population of the planet is, we, we could sustain our current population of a couple billion more. Um, you know, it's an old adage that it's not a food problem, it's a distribution problem, and there's some truth to that. But there's a lot of breakthroughs coming in technology, especially genomics, that are probably going to expand yields in places that can afford it. The problem is, is that the planet can't, or sorry, the population can't afford it. Um, part of that whole population aging thing because of Bretton Woods and globalization and industrialization is that we're all, well, we're not all of us, but a lot of the world's population is now moving in mass retirement. In fact, on average, the baby boomers of the world retire in the fourth quarter of this year. So, you know, we're like literally weeks away. And when they do that, they shift their money from stocks and bonds into more conservative investments. Because if there's a currency or market crash, then they're destitute. They can never rebuild their nest egg. Well, that's the money that pays for technological advance and application. And without that, uh, our technological uh, pace of advancement slows dramatically. So we'll have a handful of places that can still play. And thank God the United States is one of them. And the U.S. is the world's largest food producer. So we can bring automation into agriculture and genomics. Uh, and that will massively expand our food capacity. 
But for most of the rest of the world, you're looking at a disruption in the input flows that allow them to maintain their agricultural production. And that's going to be catastrophic. That's going to kill a minimum of a billion people, maybe maybe two. Uh, but there is no plan here. Uh, this is simply the end result of globalization 80 years on. I, I hate to say it, but we were probably always going to have that particular future. See, that's sort of disappointing to hear because uh, Klaus Schwab makes such a good villain. He's got the voice. <laughs> he's got the clothes. Uh, he's, he's got, got the, the big. Hair. He's got the hair. He's got the big screen behind him. It's like Spectre, but in real life. Um, uh, no, I mean, I mean, really, I think it's best to think of Schwab as like a DJ. <laughs> Um, you go to his parties because they're fun, mm -hmm. not because you're going to listen to what he says. And, and that's honestly, that's how the world elite sees him. Maybe just put like a big mouse head on his head and yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> so uh, reading the book, it it made me come to the conclusion that we're, we are definitely moving backwards. And I, I think you would agree with that. But my, my question is uh, relatively lengthy. So here it goes. The Industrial Revolution took place, which followed with the breaking open of various nations like Japan. And then there was World War One, and then there was World War II, which opened the way for complete globalization. So you're suggesting now that we're heading in a completely opposite direction, heading towards sort of a quasi-imperial age. Will war be the answer again? And is war inevitable if America's Navy is no longer keeping the seas free? Uh, well, let me break that up. So number one, we get our Western Hemispheric semi-hermetically sealed system that goes its own way. So NAFTA is already the world's second largest manufacturing base. It's already the world's largest consumption base. That gets entrenched and enriched. And I think the future of North America and anyone they decide to kind of include in the inner circle is going to be pretty bright. Uh, Japan is a country that has managed to negotiate itself into the inner circle. At the height of Trump's power, Trump and the Japanese prime minister cut a deal that was humiliating for the Japanese, but that was seen in Japan as the price of joining the club that was important. And then within a month of Biden coming in, the Japanese showed up in the Oval Office and said, just so we're clear, this deal stands. We don't want to renegotiate it. Uh, and so if the Japanese can cut a deal with both sides of the American spectrum and we're having a little bit of a political <laughs> argument, uh, you know that the Japanese are in it for the long haul. Uh, Australia is in it for the long haul. New Zealand is in it for the long haul. Britain, they've got to figure out Brexit. But once they do, I have no doubt that they're going to be kind of joining this Western Hemispheric club. Beyond that, yes, I think what you've said is a good sum up of where we're facing. Uh, if you are an advanced power that has a Navy that is capable of expeditionary operations. The question is whether or not you can access the sufficient inputs to make your system work. Now, for countries like France, agriculture is fine. Electricity is fine. Their weak point is oil. But they've got Libya and Algeria right there, which is enough for them and the cluster of countries immediately around them. So I see significant engagement by the French in that zone, and they kind of establish I wouldn't call it an empire. Um, one of the things that made the empires work is that the imperial countries were industrialized and the non-imperial countries, the colonies, were not. And so the force disconnect was huge uh, and they were able to lord over them. That's not the world now. It doesn't take an industrial base to have an AK-47. So it's going to be more of an association than a colonization. Uh, and that provides a lot more hope for some of the poorer sides. Uh, the United Kingdom will probably have to do this with Nigeria. The Germans, oh my God, uh, I don't know what the Germans are going to do because there's just not enough anywhere close by. Uh, normally, this has led the Germans into the Russian space. And based on how Russia looks like after the Ukraine war, you know, maybe there's going to be something there. But I think a disassociation of the Russian system is more likely because, sorry, the German system is more likely because the Germans have among the world's worst demographies. So by the end of this decade, the industrial model was going to collapse anyway. And the energy disruptions from the Ukraine war means it's probably going to disrupt within the next 18 months. So we may 
we will probably live through the end of the German nation here. And that'll take a lot of other pieces with it. Uh, China does not have the reach. Its Navy can really only function within about 500 miles of the coast. And they don't have the ability to reach the Middle East in the first place at scale. So if you can get things nearby, you're looking pretty good. So the Turks, the French, the Brits, uh, the Japanese are kind of a special case. I think they're going to be all right. They're not going to be as strong as they have been. They're not going to be the manufacturing powers that they have been. They're going to have to supply a lot of things within their own house. Uh, so those differentiated supply chains that have given us rapid technological advancement, uh, those go away. And that means lower incomes for a lot of the weaker members of those manufacturing supply chains. So Central Europe, I'm fairly concerned about. Uh, but for everybody else, you have to be able to basically invite someone to you who can make it. And the list of potential candidates there is short. Well, you, you mentioned, okay, you mentioned Turkey a couple of times. Um, mm -hmm. Now, th their current president is kind of a, uh, a piece of work. radical fundamentalist, wants to go back to the caliphate uh, era, or at least it seems on the surface. Um, is he going to have to switch gears and go back to, um, you know, uh, being more Western or are they going, do you think they're going to get rid of him? And then you got to look at Iran also. Uh, I mean, how do you look at some of these countries that have uh, some of these fanatical leaders who, you know, they're going to see the writing on the wall and, and they're going to have to choose between ideology and uh, and reality? Well, let's start with Iran. Iran is kind of a textbook case for a country that has the resource disease. They export crude and pistachios. Pistachios are literally their number two export. Uh, and they use it to import everything they need to make uh, modern life possible. So if anything happens to the Persian Gulf, if anything happens to the Strait of Hormuz, if anything happens to the long tanker run from the Persian Gulf to the rest of the world, uh, Iran's entire economic system collapses in a year. And I think that is exactly what's going to happen. So I am not concerned about Iran in an industrial power projection sense. I'm far more concerned about what the implications of what happens when a country of 80 million people can't import sufficient food and fertilizer to feed themselves. So like with China, I am far more concerned with Iranian weakness than strength. Turkey's very different. Turkey is self-sufficient for most of the things you need for modern life. The one thing it doesn't have is energy, but it borders countries that have it. And it's got a partner in Azerbaijan, which is not too far away. So I see the Turks having to establish, uh, uh, as you said, a neo-imperial system to make sure that that works. But honestly, they're already getting along really well with the Kurds of Iraq. So I don't think that's a very heavy carry for them. Uh, as for the nature of Erdogan, the president, um, yes, he is, he is a bit of a jerk. And he is interested in kind of a regeneration of Ottoman power, which is both secular and religious. He, he's interested in both. And I would say a lot of people within Turkey see the world the same way. Remember that Turkey is not Western. It also is not Arabic. It is its own thing. Turkey is a fundamentally independent civilization, and they are very proud of that, and they should be. Moving forward, it also means they are going to be one of the few bastions of stability, but that means they're going to go doing it their own way. So the eastern Mediterranean will basically become a Turkish lake. I expect the Israelis to buddy up as a junior alliance partner with the Turks because the Americans are, are nowhere to be seen. Uh, and how the two of them interface with Saudi Arabia will really determine the tenor of this region. And at the moment, the Saudis and the Israelis get along famously. So I can see this tripartite arrangement in the region where those three call the shots and everyone else is stomped on. Uh, it will take them 20 years to kind of set that up. But once that is done, the question is, where do they turn their attention to next? For the Turks, it would probably be to the Northwest and the Balkans. Um, so it really matters what happens to the EU. You mean they're going to try to take back the Balkans? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, I, don't, I mean, again, I don't think this is going to be an, an imperial expansion of old because we don't have the tech imbalance. And in a world where the Germans are no longer functioning, the EU in itself is going to be in severe danger. 
And if you're Bulgaria and Romania in that scenario, you look at Turkey doing just fine and you're like, hey, you know what? We have food surpluses. Is that something you're interested in? I can see the basis for an association based on Turkey, just like the French will be doing it further west. Okay. So you're not talking like an invasion. You're saying that it would be more of uh, like an alliance then. Uh, I wouldn't rule it out. It's entirely possible this this part of the world has a lot of history. Uh, but I don't think it has to go that way. In fact, if if the Israelis and the Saudis and the Turks can prove to have a mutually beneficial relationship, I can totally see Sophia and Bucharest asking to join that association. So it, reading the book, there's a lot of incoming desperation. And, and from my perspective, desperation when it comes to countries – they're desperate for uh, goods and products. Um, it leads, from my perspective, it would lead to war. Um, you have a number of nations. Um, some regions do better than others, but there are some nations like Japan and India. Uh, you mentioned France. Uh, once UK, uh, UK uh, gets their act together, there are some areas that are going to do pretty well, but there's going to be a lot of nations in desperation um, and a lot of these, and we mentioned Iran, right? A lot of their money has continued to go to, well, weaponry and just sort of just really bad, bad things instead of really protecting their people. Um, how is it that countries that are going to be running into such desperation are not going to say, okay, our, our last thing that we can do is, is fight for our survival. Therefore, we're going to have to try to take over these specific countries. Like it, it seems to me, it's like, it's either you're going to have a big fight on your hands or people are just going to resolve themselves to oblivion more or less. Yeah, no, no. I, I think you're right. The question is whether or not a war would actually potentially achieve something for them. Uh, so in the case of the Russians, part of the reason why the Ukraine war is happening is the Russians are trying to secure themselves a, a better perimeter that is more defensible in anticipation of their demographic collapse. And the uh, the points that they need to plug to prevent invasion are, unfortunately, for the Ukrainians on the other side of Ukraine. Uh, ergo, the war. I can see lots of places uh, where that sort of logic, whether it's for economic strategic reasons, uh, holds true. And I think we will see dozens, dozens of brush fire wars as people feel forced to take matters into their own hands. Uh, not all of the world is going to look like that. So I am very concerned about the African continent writ large. And I am very concerned about the countries that are on the Chinese and the Russian peripheries. Because these are places where the historical angst is significant and the integration to this point has been relatively one way. And whether it's out of operation or desperation or opportunity, I do see a lot of people reaching for the gun. But I don't think that's going to happen everywhere. Uh, in places, for example, the Turkish example that we just explored, there are a number of power centers that see an advantage to working together, especially in a world where the United States is no longer uh, managing things. Now, if you don't get along with Israel or Saudi Arabia or Turkey, look out. So like the future of Iran and Syria and Yemen and Iraq and Jordan in this environment gets very scary. And whether or not you think that is a plus or a minus, of course, depends upon how you view the region now. So when uh, this sort of uh, goes back to the U.S., um, when COVID hit and Congress started passing all of these multi-trillion COVID bills, um, a lot of money was going outside of America to other nations. And I want to pull a quote from your, from your book. You wrote, the entire concept of the order is that the United States disadvantages it itself economically in order to purchase the loyalty of a global alliance. That is what globalization is. The past several decades wasn't an American century. It was an American sacrifice. The American century is only now beginning. And so my question is, the COVID bills seemed to me more like donations to other countries 
Um, is that what America was doing, shoring up loyalty, like a global alliance? Uh, let me make sure I understand where you're coming from here. Are you saying that the money that was put in people's pockets that was then spent on imported goods was a donation? So, well, okay, if they were if they were done for bringing in imported goods, I guess just from from the face of it, it seemed like hundreds of billions of dollars was were going to other countries to sort of help stabilize them during this well, I mean, COVID just, just pandemic. Sure I, I mean, the money wasn't just given to them. Okay. The money was spent domestically, and then American consumers bought products that were, on average, imported. Okay. Well, it just and, yeah. Go ahead. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, but why was it that um, these COVID bills were sort of sectioned off to like have billions of dollars go to specific countries instead of just continuing trade as usual? Well, the, the money that went to foreign countries, to my understanding, and I have not dissected this apparently to the level you have, were mostly for vaccines. And the, the economic benefits would have been indirect via American consumer purchases of things like electronics, because all of a sudden we all needed a home office. And the United States does not do the bulk of the computing and telephony uh, uh, manufacturing business. Most of that is in East Asia. Uh, as for trade as usual, um, that really wasn't an option, especially in 2020 with lockdowns being the norm. Uh, and as Asia opened up in 2021, wow, the health cost of that was significant. Um, now that we're in the end of 2022 and pretty much everyone in the world has a combination of natural immunity and vaccinated immunity, we're in a better situation now. But uh, I, I try not to be too hard on the policymakers who are dealing with an unprecedented situation. Uh, it's not like we had any examples in human memory of how to handle something like COVID. We were literally making it up as we went. And I don't think uh, local government officials get enough credit. I mean, did we all make this right, same, the, the right decisions every single time? Of course not. But there was no playbook. Uh, and everybody did the best that they could, in my opinion. So why is the American century only just beginning? If if what you're saying is like the end of globalization. Sure. In, in the world before World War II, from Reconstruction to World War II, the United States just went on this massive growth spurt because we were metabolizing basically a continent worth of resources. Our population was expanding greatly. And we were reaching out to establish trade links with other countries. Sometimes we weren't very kind about it, but it generated the fastest economic growth we had ever known. And it was going hand in hand with the early industrialization process. World War II stopped that. We stopped that on purpose because we found out that with a world that was in the atomic age, that sort of expansion would trigger conflicts and anyway, there were other power centers in the Eastern Hemisphere who had their own ideas about how things were go, would go, and one of them was the Soviet Union. So containment bubbled up, and in order to build the alliance, we had to sacrifice a lot economically, because otherwise we would have been, what, militarily occupying the entire world? Uh, we found out in Iraq, again, that we're not very good at doing that when it's only one country. Can you imagine doing it for a hundred? I mean, there's nothing about that that would have worked. So we tamped down our economic opportunities in order to encourage the economic opportunities of other places. But that era is now coming to an end. And if the United States is somewhat unconstrained and can focus more on its own economic interests, then we kind of go back to where we were in the 1910s and the 1920s, just with a much larger economy, with a much more powerful military and a much higher technological base. At the same time, most of the rest of the world is stagnating and falling. So the explosion of economic activity we're going to see in this coming century is massive. And some of it, just because of the mechanics of how China, Germany, and Russia are failing, is going to be front-loaded. The Ukraine war means that the German industrial model is dying. The Ukraine war plus demographics plus mismanagement means the Chinese model is dying. And Russia, even if they win, is basically fencing itself off from the world. That's a world where the United States is the only power that matters. That's a world in which the United States needs to double the size of its industrial plant just to make the goods that the population has become accustomed to. 
that will generate the fastest economic growth we have ever seen. And on the backside of that transition period, our supply chains will be local, they'll be closer to their consumers, they'll have fewer steps, they'll be harder to disrupt, they'll be broadly immune to things that happen in the Eastern Hemisphere, it will employ people that are from this continent and serve people who are from this continent. We finally get to where we would have been probably in 1950 if the world wars had not happened. And that is the start of an American century. Well, that sounds pretty good. Um, yeah. We'll get there. I mean, we're <laughs> Americans. We'll get there by the most difficult route possible, but we'll get there. Of course. So your book, reading it, is full of historical content. Um, just just great, uh, a great resource for knowing how we got here. Since this is a history show, um, how has the study of history helped you become like a successful geopolitical strategist? Oh, well, one of the beautiful things about geography is it does not change very quickly. I mean, you're talking under normal circumstances, thousands of years to have an evolution in something that would make a meaningful difference. So history is just events playing off across the same geography, often in the same way, it's just in different eras with different personalities. Uh, so once you figure out you know, the, the mechanics of a region, like how the mountains and the plains and the rivers and the oceans interplay to create the entity that is there, the culture that is there, you can then dial back through history till you, till you get to the beginning. Uh, and one of the things I enjoy most, and I try to make this core to most of my work, is telling the story from the very beginning, like, you know, pre-industrial, not just pre-industrial, but pre-sedentary agriculture, to see how, as the technology evolves, our relationship with our geography changes. The geography doesn't change, our relationship changes because all of a sudden we have a new tool. So sedentary agriculture gave rise to certain types of civilizations that then ruled their worlds for not centuries, but millennia. But in time, that gave way to advances in metals, which shifted the geographies that were successful somewhere else. Industrialization and deep water navigation did the same things. And so the story replays, but kind of with a new player. And I just find that entire process fascinating. And a lot of what the book is, is showing how through these technological ages, we got to where we are. Globalization made a dramatic transformation and deglobalization puts us back in a world where the interplay with technology and geography will once again determine much of the human condition. And we're, we're already knee deep in that transition. Well, Alan, you got anything else? Because I got like two more relatively quick, not super serious questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just going to be... Um... You know, back in back in the colonial days, we had uh, mer uh, mer mercantilism. If I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, yeah. okay. Is 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 this uh, is this in play? Is this how things are going to turn out? Or yeah, I think you're right. I think we're going to have a lot more of that. So the very concept of mercantilism is that you try to keep the sensitive parts of your economy not just insulated from everybody else. You deliberately overproduce and then product dump on captive markets, both to generate the income that you were after, as well as to destroy potential competition in the future. So, for example, um, in the early industrial age, the Brits had industrialized, the Germans had not. The Germans had the most productive guild manufacturing, but they hadn't industrialized. So the Brits would dump their surplus products, things like textiles on the German market and basically cause a deflationary collapse within the local economy. Uh, I expect we will see a lot of that from the parts of the world that are more successful moving forward. Uh, unfortunately, the last time the United States did this, we called it dollar diplomacy and it generated a lot of political uh, destruction in China and earned us a lot of angst and anger throughout Latin America that still exists today. I'm hoping we'll be a little bit less of a prick about it this next time, but I can see the Japanese doing the same thing. The French will absolutely do the same thing. Well, no promises on not being a prick about it. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so my question is sort of like without the U S I think the, the UN is pretty much as useless as tits on a boar hog. Uh, <laughs> what, 
What happens to the UN with all of this? Uh, the UN was only, well, sorry, the use of UN was useful in two ways. Number one, there's a lot of minutia that needed to be taken care of in order to manage the globalized system, things like mail and international standards. And for that, the UN was actually pretty good. Um, second, it kept great power competition. Uh, it, it kept the players talking. And in a bipolar world between the Soviets and the Americans, it was useful to force certain conversations into the open so that they didn't turn into shooting. In a multi polar world where the strongest power is broadly disinterested yes you're right the un really serves no purpose we would need a new sort of institution um but it needs to be a talk shop uh, one of the things that we overreached for when we formed the un was the idea that what the security council said would be law internationally and that never really worked out because every country still has sovereignty. And if you want to do that, then you have to go there and militarily enforce it. And it did provide a nice little international law, big leaf for cover. But that's, as we're seeing with the Ukraine war, it's utterly useless at preventing conflicts when a major power is involved. Uh, so we need sort of a concert of powers negotiating forum. Uh, the only one of those we have at the moment is the G7. And those are countries that for most topics are broadly on the same side. Uh, we are not going to get a functional successor until the world has settled a little bit. So you're talking about at least 10 years from now when we can see who's going to be around when the dust settles, uh, when the Germans and the Chinese and the Russians are no longer available to play those kinds of roles. I have a difficult time imagining what that court sort of structure would look like because everything else is going to be defined by the relationship with the United States. And the United States probably is not going to see a huge benefit for building an institution that would be expressly designed to limit American options. It would be easier for us to just handle everything within our own institutions and bilateral talks. And I think that most of the countries that are going to partner with us, Australia, Japan, Mexico, and the United Kingdom at the top of the list, are going to see things more or less the same way. They have privileged access to Washington. They don't see the need to share that. All right. Well, my my last question, your book mentioned some very dire things, uh, shortages, famines, starvation. Um, is this why Nicole Kidman and now King Charles are recommending eating bugs? <laughs> um at the risk of like freaking out Americans, uh, there are a number of cultures where bugs are just part of the diet and some of them are industrialized. Mm -hmm. Like the Koreans love grasshoppers. Uh, I've had them. I can't say that I enjoyed the experience, um, but I think we've all traveled enough to have food that kind of scratches the itch or food that absolutely does not scratch the itch. Uh, Bug production is just animal protein by another name, and I would argue it's not any more environmentally friendly than most of our animal protein production. So I think, I think, I think, I think, because I have not spent a lot of time thinking about bugs, <laughs> uh, that the argument is that because it uses a different input stream, that if we have a catastrophic failure in some other input stream, then we have a backup protein source. I don't think it's anything more sophisticated than that. And, you know, that, and that's logical from my point of view. That doesn't mean I'm going to start eating Korean grasshoppers. I've, I've eaten snails, so I don't know if that uh, falls into the same category. Yeah, you know, snails, it's mostly a butter and garlic delivery system. I don't think I qualify. Mmm, delish. Yeah. <clears throat> well, see, I've eaten it the Lebanese way, and believe me, it was nothing like the French way. So, oh, and I, yeah, yeah, my mom forced me when I was a kid, but now that my mom is... Uh, you know, in a retirement community, she can't do anything of the kind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my... Lebanese food, yeah, <laughs> it, it's like similar but different. The, the, I mean, having a big plate of chicken livers put in front of you is intimidating until you try one. Like, oh, yeah, okay, I can totally get on board with this. Yeah, not too shabby. Yeah, my parents, uh, when I was a kid, forced me to eat green linguine from a can. I think I'd rather eat bugs than that stuff again, for sure. <laughs> linguine in a can. <laughs> it was horrendous um that was my vietnam so gotcha yeah hey peter anyway, but it, it, 
this is a conversation that we're all going to be having in a few years. 80% of the world's foodstuffs are produced with imported inputs. And if you break down the input stream, you have a choice between either finding something else that is more appropriate to the inputs you can access or not eating. Now, in the United States, we're going to be fine because we're actually the source of not just the single largest chunk of agricultural production in the world. We're the source of a lot of the inputs, too. So we are not going to have to wrestle with this overly. But a lot of the rest of the world, this is going to be part of their new normal. Crazy. Just crazy. Um, Peter, this was awesome. I could not wait to talk to you because, like I said, I had so many questions. I really enjoyed the book. Uh, it's called The End of the World is Just the Beginning. Um, if you haven't yet, you got to go get it. Um, Peter, thanks for for all you do, giving us sort of um, sort of a, hey, here's what's coming and here's how to at least be mentally, spiritually, and emotionally prepared uh, for what's coming, even if you can't be really physically prepared. Although I have purchased a lot of bags of rice. <laughs> you know, you guys, with your historical approach to things, based on a lot of your questions, you might look like my third book, Disunited Nations. Mm -hmm. Because whereas end of the world goes through all the economic sectors and how we shape our world the way we do and where it's taking us, Disunited Nations does that for 11 countries, uh, six of which are the ones that we like know are going to be the global leaders, but really aren't, and five of which are the ones that are going to rise to the top. And just like with End of the World, it starts at the very beginning. Interesting. Um, mm. That may be the new name for the UN. D N. <laughs> <laughs> it would be more appropriate. Well, yeah. I never uh, held, man. They, they were having problems from the very beginning. So, mm -hmm. well, in, in its defense, it was designed for that. It was designed to be a talk shop where no one got along to encourage them to argue so that they don't argue on the battlefield. And in that, it has been moderately successful. Yeah. No, uh, no world wars um, as yeah. of yet, just a lot of small ones. Well, there hasn't been a, uh, there hasn't been a uh, war in central, I want to say central and Western Europe, probably in the longest stretch in the history of Europe. Absolutely. Now it helps that the Americans basically occupy, well, the Americans and the Russians occupied, those lands for most of the last 75 years but your point stands well you know and, and another, another thing to look at not only just on that one but the league of nations was a uh, european that was run mostly by the british and the french but the un i think the u.s learned from that and we're like no we're taking over right well and, with the league of the nations we formed it and then did not join it right Okay, I didn't know how much Wilson had in, was involved on on that one because I knew I, I knew that we never we didn't join it we didn't ratify the Treaty of Versailles, so um, I, I yeah, but I just knew that when we when we kind of ran things with the UN it it stuck. Whereas the league, oh, yeah, I mean, the, the difference between the interwar period and the Cold War period is that the United States decided to lead in the Cold War period. Whereas mm -hmm. with World War One, we stepped in, we helped finish the war, but then rather mm -hmm. than build a structure that would prevent the factors that created the war from reasserting themselves, we left, which guaranteed that those factors reinserted themselves. Right. And we got ourselves in another war. Now, looking forward, us backing away from the world, in my opinion, is strategically unwise because it will guarantee the creation of regional powers that will eventually challenge American interests. And we will have to do this all over again. But the people who believe my way, that engagement is the way you improve the human condition and ultimately guarantee American security, we have lost every presidential election seven times in a row. And this last one, we didn't even have somebody on the ticket. Uh, so Americans, for the moment, do not agree with me. And that is taking us in the direction of the book. Well, because I think a lot of people are taking the advice of George Washington when he left. And I think, um, you and, know, and one, in a, in a pre-industrialized world, it was good advice. That's not our world anymore. Well, I know that, and this kind of supports what you're saying, that when the League of Nations was, when we, we didn't get involved and it was run by Britain and France during the interwar period, 
there were a lot of prejudices between Europeans that had been going on for 2000 years. Sure. Whereas we, the United States, not only do, did, were we a country full of Germans, British, French, whatnot, we didn't have, um, you know, the history of warfare with those countries other than Britain. We didn't have the history of warfare that just kind of um, gave us a different view of how we wanted to treat those countries. So we came in, I think, in a more neutral, neutral stance, whereas with the, you know, France, when uh, when when they gave uh, Germany, uh, when they showed them what the treaty was, the Treaty of Versailles, where they're like, you want peace with us, uh, Germany? Here are the terms. And, it, mm-hmm. you know. But we didn't have anything of the sort when we took over and captured uh, Germany and Japan. No, yeah, the United States, because its interests were, for the most part, in a different hemisphere, um, mm-hmm. the, the kind way to put it would be that we were an unbiased participant, unbiased observer. Uh, the way the Europeans would say, the Europeans would call that arrogant uh, because we just didn't care about their their baggage. Uh, and both, are, I think, are accurate assessments. Well, maybe it's time that um, the kings and the presidents and uh, everybody else start marrying off their daughters to other <laughs> leaders, and we have the – that's how we unify and uh, keep wars from yeah, happening. That, yeah, that worked, that worked out well. Yes, it did <laughs> every single time. Well, the British princes are, are on the job. Yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah. They are, a lot of errors yeah. in the pipeline. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I know that Prince Andrew had uh, some international relations with some, <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, not, well said. <laughs> that was perfect. With, with the future of the uh, world. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Had his own little island. All right. Well, Peter, hey, man, this was great. Uh, thanks again for spending so much time with us. Um I would say best to you and all of your future endeavors, but it seems like you're doing pretty well. So yeah, I just need more uh, sleep. That's all. Yeah. Well, go, go get it. Uh, you can be like Alan who, uh, takes Ambien every night. Um, isn't that right, Alan? Uh, that's correct. Yeah. I know you don't mind me mentioning that because you mentioned it on the last show. So yeah, it doesn't. (laughs) Yeah. I've been that way for a long time. No fun. God bless you. All right. You gents have a good day. You Take too. Care. Thanks again, all Peter. Right. All the best, man. Thanks again. Enjoyed it. Well, that was very enlightening, uh, quite sobering, a um, lot of fun, really good, really great guest. Uh, what did you think, Alan? I, I I thoroughly enjoyed that conversation, and I was surprised I got through pretty much all of my questions. Well, you know, it, a lot of it was not what I was expecting to see how the world was going to go. Um you know, I, I I felt that globalization was going to keep going ahead. That uh, what what's that Schwab guy's name? Yeah, Klaus Schwab. Klaus Schwab's. I keep thinking Peter Schwab. Uh huh. I don't or, know why. Or Charles. Klaus Schwab. Charles, Charles Schwab. You know, when I see when I see people like Klaus Schwab and many others, I'm eek. But um, yeah, the the it's, it is kind of a bleak outlook to the third world and. Um, you know, not bad for the United States, not bad for the, the Western Hemisphere. Um, I, I would hate to see some of our allies becoming some of our adversaries, so I hope it doesn't come to that. But I do like what he has to say about Red China. You know, I love Taiwan, really do not care much for Red China, and I would love to see their system collapse. Yeah, me too. And I think a lot of the world would like to see that. Um, With that collapse, though, it looks like it's going to be very detrimental just for the commoner uh, out there. So that is not good. But that's the thing. When you try to control nature, um, and that's one of the things that he talks about in the book and we talked about in the conversation, is you're trying to control how many children people are having something that is very natural like it's like it's a personal choice on how many children you want to have and when you're having this one child act how you couldn't see that you weren't going to have a really good replacement percentage on people going out and people coming in um not a lot of foresight but hence the world of being a communist uh not a lot of foresight so ladies and gentlemen go check out the book 
Uh, I hope that um, you don't drink yourself into oblivion after having that uh, conversation. So uh, what do you think? Book and movie recommendation? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, I think we're ready for that. Let's get let's get on with that. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my book and movie. Here we go. Obviously, the book, and I really, really, really enjoyed the book. It gives you see what did I tell you that fly. There is that fly. Um, it gives you a region by region, almost a country by country. Like he discusses so many countries on a very um, macro, micro level. Um, he gives you so much information to go off of on why a country is going to do well, why it's going to do okay, or why it's going to do very poorly. And honestly, it's pretty freaking convincing because it's it, it sort of just is the natural process of things. If you don't have things coming in or if you can't feed your, your people, the people of your country, that's not good. If you don't have technology coming in because you don't have the infrastructure to produce it yourself, that is not good. So he really does a fantastic job breaking it down. Can't recommend that book enough. If you want more of a recommendation, you can check out my review that I put up on the Epic Times as I do with a lot of books uh, that we have um, on this show. My movie is The Book of Eli with Denzel Washington. If you haven't watched that movie, it is about the end of the world. Um, and it is pretty cool. And I'll go ahead, just for conversation's sake, World War Z as well. Um, world War Z sort of plays a pivotal role, uh, especially right now, regarding a pandemic um, we just lived through. So that's pretty timely. That's it for me, man. Hey, you know, I always wondered, it, was he blind in that movie, The Book of Eli? Yes. The whole time? The whole time. And he was able to fight. That's He's, interesting. Hey, man, that supersonic hearing. I guess so. <laughs> I remember in Kung Fu, something about a grasshopper or something. How did you hear the grasshopper? And the other guy goes, how did you not hear it? <laughs> Can't do the yeah, voices more or less, very same well. Thing. Uh, okay, so my book. I, I'm gonna uh, same thing for the book. The uh, the end of the world is just the beginning. Um, I'm gonna recommend that as the uh, book of the week uh, for the movie. I don't even know how well known it is, but it is kind of, it is considered a classic. It came out in 1960. It's called Exodus, and it was about the. Um, the um, the civil war that took place in Palestine, uh, you know, in 1947, and then the the declaration of the Jewish state uh, into Israel uh, in 48, and you know, it's got Paul Newman in it. It's got uh, John Derrick, that was uh, Bo Derrick's husband. Uh, it had uh, let's see, Peter Lawford, who was uh, one of the rat, one of the members of the Rat Pack, and you also had Eva Marie Saint. It's a good movie. It's an, it's an epic. It was uh, written by uh, Leon Uris. Um, enjoyable movie. I recommend it. Again, it, it is a classic. It's well made. It's a, it's a good story. Uh, the acting is good. The action is good. So, uh, yeah, check it out before that movie disappears. Before that movie makes its own exodus, right? Before it makes its own exodus. Because, you know, I'll tell you... I, when I go through like Amazon, I know I've been noticing a lot of movies that they're just not there. I don't know why. Are they getting rid of them, or there's just not a market for them? I don't know. But either way, get it. Bef like I said, get it before you know they decide that there's not a market for it and they stop making it. See, I that is one thing that I like that you do. You buy a lot, and I try to do this myself. Uh, you buy a lot of hard copy stuff. I can't. I can't encourage people enough to buy hard copy books um, because you never know. We may end up like the book of Eli to where uh, there aren't any more books and all you got is one guy carrying one book that everybody wants and will kill for it. Uh, and that would actually end up being the Bible as far as on the movie. But anyways. Well, the, the, uh, the Martian Chronicles is what alarmed me um, that you need to you need to get 
hard copy books because there were a couple of uh, politically incorrect chapters that if you go and look locate an old copy of the Martian Chronicles, it has those chapters in them. But if you look at the new ones, they're not in there. And I know this for a fact because we, we compared notes. I had a buddy of mine. He had his book. I had mine. Mine was a much older copy. Uh, his was a new one, and they weren't in there. I'm telling you, man, the, uh, it is not good. It is not good. And if you rely strictly on digital, you're going to get screwed. I'm just going to say, you're going to get screwed, and you're going to, and you won't even know it. So, all right. Well, enough bad news for this episode. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good news. We'll see you next week. <laughs>